Good afternoon, Brevard. Uh, this is John Scott, Brevard County Emergency Management Director, uh, coming to you live today from our National Weather Service Melbourne. I'm here today with uh, Will Ulrich, who is our uh, warning coordination uh, specialist uh, here in the office. And what we thought we'd do today is uh, have a little conversation about severe weather awareness. Uh, today, Will, is the start of Severe Weather Awareness Week, uh, so we know that we've already seen a little bit of a rougher winter, and that's likely to continue as we go forward, so why don't we do a little thing today where we'll talk about the weather, we'll talk about some things we want folks to know, uh, and then we'll uh, maybe take some questions from people who are tuning in uh, on Severe Weather Awareness and what we can be doing as a county to make sure we're staying prepared. So, Will? I'll turn it to you. Yeah, sounds good, John. Thanks uh, for the invitation and thanks for putting this on. You know, today is day one of Severe Weather Awareness Week. Uh, it's a five-day affair that starts today and continues through this Friday. Today is Lightning Safety Awareness Day. And in the past, lightning was actually the number one killer of residents and visitors to the state of Florida, but it's actually taking a back seat now to uh, marine-related fatalities, and that includes rip currents uh, along our beach, uh, along our coastline. In fact, last year, um, though we lost four people to lightning fatalities, we lost upwards of 20 people to rip currents. And so almost five times the number of lightning fatalities. Uh, and that's you know, becoming a big problem, uh, not just for, for visitors who aren't maybe familiar with the threat of rip currents, but also uh, tourists and um, even people who live along the coastline. I was looking at statistics with one of our forecasters earlier, and about 50% of people who die uh, in Florida uh, along our coastlines from rip currents are tourists, and the other 50% are Floridians, those who live either at the coast or okay. inland. So it's kind of distributed evenly, but nonetheless, it still poses a huge problem for us because we're in the business of safety. safety yeah. right? nice. And I think all about when we talk about rip currents, and it's why it's so important we encourage folks. If you're not someone who goes to the beach often, if you're not familiar with what that ocean environment is like, it's really critical you're swimming near a lifeguard and at a lifeguarded beach. Uh, because we also know that when we see those fatalities, they happen outside of lifeguarded beaches and outside of lifeguard hours, right? In the evening when things are switching and stuff. So, I mean, in general, a good rule of thumb is if you're not comfortable in the ocean, certainly don't you don't, go you don't too, belong in there. Don't go too deep. Yeah, you don't belong in there, right? <laughs> but then if, if, if you are, you know, be near a guard in case something happens. Yeah, that's the one thing that we've seen a lot of. These uh, fatalities are occurring in unguarded yep. areas, and that's a huge problem because we have such an expansive coastline in Brevard County, but all of East Central Florida. It would be nearly impossible to put lifeguards at every single location. We simply can't do that. But those of you visiting, or even those of you who are residents who want to just get and enjoy a day at the beach, we, we highly encourage you, first and foremost, to be at a lifeguarded beach. Why? Not just because you're protected by lifeguards, but also those lifeguards are designed to look for hazards in the water. And so they are putting up flags to help identify the different threats for that day. And they'll tell you, it's not safe to get in the water today, so stay out. Yeah, and that's actually Tuesday, tomorrow is right. Marine and Rip Current Day as far as uh, we talk about Severe Weather Awareness Week. And, uh, Coincidentally for us, Lightning Day is today, and we'll probably see some lightning later today. In the yeah, water. it's certainly been an active, you know, winter for us in terms of the number of storms. And last night was one of those cases where we saw thunderstorms with some hail move across the area. We expect more of that. We're actually entering the peak of our severe weather season here in East Central Florida, and that's expected to continue through about the middle of April before we transition to the pattern that we're so used to, which is those summer rainy thunderstorms. But of course their biggest punch generally is lightning associated with those. The storms that we see over the next couple of months, because of the added wind shear in our atmosphere, can be a lot stronger and sometimes severe. So the threat of tornadoes can be very high, the threat of significant hail events can be very high, and flooding rainfall, of course, is always a potential problem. So day three of Severe Weather Awareness Week, which is this Wednesday, is severe weather and tornadoes. And that's kind of why we're doing today. That's a big driver today. Yeah, that's why we want to talk about, uh, particularly in the background of El Nino. And I know El Nino has been thrown around a lot this year. But the fact is, I can't think of any other weather phenomena that has more of an influence on Central Florida weather than El Nino. Back in the late 90s, someone wrote a book about El Nino that called it the master weather maker because the fact is that 
a phenomena which refers to water temperatures in the Pacific Ocean has huge implications on the weather around the globe, and that includes here in Central Florida. So that's why we kind of wanted to talk about that today. Yeah, and El Nino is such a big player for us. Specifically, we talk about strong El Ninos yeah, especially and strong. our winter weather. Yeah, I think you've got a couple things to maybe walk us through. I do, yeah. I think one of the first things that I wanted to show was this fatality chart on the background, which I know is going to be difficult for those of you at home to be able to read, so I'll try my best. But one of the things that this shows is the number of marine-related fatalities that we're seeing more than ever before. This is a 30-year fatality chart of deaths within the state of Florida. So 1992 through 2021 shows nearly 50% of the 957 people weather-related deaths that we had over that 30-year period occurred in the marine environment. Now that may be boating-related accidents, but more importantly that incur in also includes rip current and surf-related fatalities. Again, lightning is now taking a back seat to these marine-related fatalities. If you look at the chart, the orange color that you see in the top right, that's lightning. About 20% of the fatalities that we've seen over the past 30 years have been related to lightning. So we have to focus more and more of our efforts in keeping people safe along our coastline. When it comes to lightning fatalities, this chart here shows the trend in lightning fatalities across the past 20 years. And on the chart on the left, that's absolute number of people who have died in the United States starting in 2001 on the left and 2023 on the right. And what do you notice with that chart, John? It is dropping, right? So, and we believe a lot of our outreach efforts have helped contribute to that statistically significant drop in the number of fatalities uh, associated with lightning. We hope to be able to do the same with marine-related fatalities through increased outreach and yeah. preparedness as well. I mean, I mean, you see, this is clearly, you know, it's a 20-year effort to get us to where we are with this. And it goes before that. You yeah. know, you've got to imagine it goes back into the 80s and 90s as well. We really got to make that same push on the marine side of the house. And I think folks have, uh, you know, we now have weather apps on our phones. We're now paying a lot more attention to those things. So we see when, you know, it says, hey, lightning comes in the That's area true. within 10 miles of you, and, and we know what to do. I think where we're not is if we're going to the beach that day, maybe we see on our phone it says a rip current statement, but we just roll right through it. So we've got to yeah. take the same vigilance and the same kind of actions when our phones and our other folks tell us about these kinds of things and make sure we're incorporating it into our actions, which is really what we want to do, right? There's two parts of all of this, right? There's the understanding and understanding your risk and knowing your risk, and then understanding what it is you're supposed to do and put it into place so that you're as safe as possible. You know who helps identify that risk, especially when you choose to take you and your family to the coastline? Lifeguards. So that's why we encourage so much for folks to go to lifeguarded beaches, because the fact is they're the ones that are trained to identify rip currents and can mark areas on the beach that may be more unsafe uh, than others. Rip currents, this is just a safety graphic. Bottom line is because it's becoming such a prolific killer in our own backyard, you know, we, we have to talk about it. One of the Biggest things that people try to do when they get caught in the rip currents is to try and fight it. And that is the absolute worst thing that you can do. Because if you look at the statistics of people who die as a result of rip currents, people of all age groups, whether it's in their teens all the way through the 50, whether they're 50 year old or 60 year old, 60 year olds, the fact is all age groups are susceptible to rip currents because rip currents can move up to eight miles per hour, which to most people, fast drivers out there may sound slow, Eight miles per hour is faster than Michael Phelps can swim in an Olympics. So to put it into perspective, you're not going to win against that rip current, okay? So that's why we tell people, do not fight. In fact, the best thing that you can do is try to escape out the side because rip currents are narrow channels of water that develop as a result of breaks in the sandbar. So if people try and fight it, they're only going to exert that needed energy to get back to the shoreline. And so we encourage people, of course, to swim near lifeguarded uh, beaches to not put themselves in harm's way, but if they do get caught in a rip current, break out the side and then work their way back to the shoreline. Ride the waves back to the coast. Yeah, I get it. I think that's a message those of us who've grown up here, lived here a long time, know that if you do get a rip current, you just sort of let it take you out and then... It's not swim. giving you a free ride to the Bahamas. No, it is not. No. Nope. Then swim parallel to the shore until you get out of the hard current. And the kind of sound you see here is at most beaches, especially where we have large parks and crossovers, just to remind folks, you know, if you're out there, what to do again, swim parallel, get out of it, conserve your energy. Yeah. All right. I think yeah. we've talked about rip currents enough. This is kind of the crux of why we wanted to talk to you all today, right? El Nino. It is. And it's such a, I mean, and it's so different, right? Especially you know, as we talk more about, so different from our normal 
severe weather pattern. We, you know, we touched on that yet. Severe weather season is this time of year for us. El Nino amplifies that. It's really important that we get that amplified message out. Florida doesn't have traditionally four seasons, right? We have two seasons, the wet and uh, warm season, which occurs during the summer months, and then the cool and dry season. Why do we call it dry? On average, only about one third of our annual rainfall occurs between the middle of October and the middle of May. That's a seven month period where we only get one third of our annual rainfall. So that's why we call it the dry season. But what, do, what does it take to get rain during the dry season? Cold fronts. And with cold fronts, especially during El Nino winters, we can see severe weather. Some of our strongest El Nino winters have been associated with very active uh, storminess patterns, including ones that have gone on to produce prolific tornado outbreaks. For the most part, historically speaking, they have those big events like 1998 and 2007 have avoided Brevard County, but not by much. Not by 1998. Much. Uh, tore through Osceola, Orange, Seminole, and Volusia County. We actually did have an EF2 tornado in, in northern Brevard County. And then in 2007, a damaging EF3 tornado ripped across Volusia County and uh, Lake County in the middle of the night. So the fact is, these systems have impacted our community, uh, and if not just in our backyard, very near uh, Brevard County. So that's why we need to re remain really vigilant about these. Yeah, and I think it's important when you talk about these kinds of things to let folks know that, you know, we, you know, people know us in Florida for the hurricanes, right, and, other, and those kinds of things. And then you think about tornadoes, you think about Oklahoma and Nebraska sure. and Iowa. And in the, that Midwest, that tornado alley where they really, giant tornadoes run through. I think what folks don't understand is the Florida usually is in the top five for tornadoes every year. Now, our tornadoes are quick tornadoes. Yep. Um, you know, down, we'll touch the ground, then they're back up, and they're gone before we really notice what happens. What makes uh, this kind of winter different is you do get that potential for that longer EF2, even Long the EF3, tornado. where it stays on the ground and does significant damage as it moves. So again, it's why for you know, this winter, especially when we talk about uh, our severe weather, because tornadoes come at night, right? This stuff's gonna usually come through at night. Uh, people are resting, people are getting ready for the next day. Uh, maybe they're not paying as much of attention. Uh, and then that's really when we see those kinds of things start. So you wanna talk some more about yeah, that looks you like. just brought up an interesting point. We've been doing some local research that shows 75% of tornadoes during the dry season happen at night. And so that's when people are letting their guard down, right? Or they just might be asleep, right? So having ways to receive alert messages, particularly in the middle of the night, is a crucial part of having a severe weather awareness plan at your location. 1998, 2007, both examples of tornadoes that occurred during strong El Nino winters that went on to kill upwards of 60 plus people. 59 out of those 60 plus people were uh, those folks who lived in mobile and manufactured homes. So we have to pay attention to our most, most vulnerable, vulnerable in our community. Agreed. Agreed. We talked about that. It's important. And we'll talk about some more about what we're doing with location-based alerts and a lot of the technology that's happened since 98 and 2007. But. So I wanted to briefly touch on why is it that we anticipate having a busier than usual dry season in terms of seasonal storminess? The main reason is El Nino. El Nino is one of the main drivers in something known as the subtropical jet stream, which you can see on the bottom of the screen here. That image is of North America and that red line represents the subtropical jet stream that typically peaks during the winter months and during El Nino's it gets even stronger. And so, so as that jet extends across Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico and Florida, it brings with it increased storminess and wind shear. Wind shear is one of those primary drivers that helps produce and, and lead tornadoes to last longer. So the stronger the wind shear, the more uh, favorable the environment is for tornadoes. So with the placement of that subtropical jet, and the strength of it due to an El Nino situation like we're in now can help lead to that increased storminess that brings more potential for tornadoes, severe weather, and episodes of heavy rainfall. The chart here represents uh, the number of tornadoes that we've seen over the state of Florida during non-El Nino winters. And you'll see a smattering of some black dots on the screen there, which represents EF0, EF1 tornadoes. Of course, those tornadoes are still a threat to you and I, right? They can have winds of up to 100 to 110 miles per hour but notice how there aren't that many of them and they're not on the ground for very long versus El Nino winters, which the chart looks like this. It's a fundamentally different looking chart, right, John? 
Notice the amount of red that appears on the screen. And I know it might be, again, might be difficult for those of you viewing at home, but understand that this chart does represent a almost two to three fold increase in the number of tornadoes and the duration and strength of those tornadoes. So these tornadoes are on the ground longer, so we consider them strong to violent tornadoes. And the likelihood of those type of tornadoes goes up significantly during El Nino winters, of which we are in one now. So that's why we need to, to remain on guard these next couple of months. Yeah, again, I, just, I, mean, I know it may be hard for folks to see it, but like it really was just a smattering of black dots. And now you should at least be able to see those longer red track lines on that screen. And it's what we talked about where usually small, quick, down and about, especially during the summer. Yeah, yeah exactly. Now we're talking about on the ground, causing damage, being a significant problem to local communities. And you can sort of see right on that, if you look at it, again, it's right on that I-4 corridor is yeah. where that stuff hits. And we are just below that I-4 corridor, so it's not going to take much to bump those storms a little bit down. That's why we've got to make sure everyone's paying attention. That's why being aware is so critical to what we're doing today. Yeah, and a astute observer on the screen might notice that some of those red lines do intersect for Hard County. Yes. Because the fact is, in the past, if we go back to the 1950s, there have been examples of EF2, EF3 tornadoes. We go back to 1958, 1966, when observations were a little more sparse back then, nonetheless. But nonetheless, there's evidence that we did have EF2 related or EF3 rated tornadoes in our own backyard here. But 1998 and 2007 missed us by just a smidge. So, of course, uh, that doesn't mean uh, we're going to miss out the next time we see a big no. spirit. We need to be prepared regardless of what Mother Nature throws at us, right? Agreed, 100%. Last chart here uh, is uh, something that you uh, want to talk about, John, yeah. related to alert for fire. So now we've talked about why it's important. Uh, we talk about severe weather season, really in this severe weather season with El Nino, right? The number one thing we can all be doing to make sure we're prepared once we know that we've got an enhanced risk this year is make sure we have location-based alerts available to us. Easiest way to do that is go to our website with emergency management, which is embrevard.com and sign up for alerts. There's an alert sign up page on the right, and then you get this uh, lovely screen here, and then you just scroll down to the bottom, you accept the terms, you create an account, and then you can tie all kinds of alerts uh, to your physical address. You can also tie it to your works address. Maybe you have a loved one who you also want to receive alerts for. But when we talk about sort of the difference between 98 and 2007, the biggest way we were able to communicate risk then was either over the television, or no weather radio alert. Things have changed since then. Dramatically changed. Yeah. Now you can get it on your phone. And why that's so critical is on y'all's best day at the weather service, and they do an outstanding job, but on your best day, you're going to get about 15 minutes of notice before, hey, tornado is on the ground if it's in your neighborhood and then at your house, right? So that alert that's going to pop as soon as the weather service issues the, uh, the tornado warning for your area, that's your signal. Hey, I gotta get going. I gotta put my plan in action. I gotta know where to go. And it starts by being able to get it. And I know, and folks may be watching this say, I get a lot of alerts on my phones, my emails go, I get it. But I promise you, this is an alert that will save your life. And if you can go in there and go into our system, you can just sign up for tornado warnings. That's all you have to do. Your phone will already go off on a tornado warning if you keep the emergency alerts enabled. But if you're someone who's turned them on, one, Please turn them back on. <laughs> Two, if you don't want to do that, go sign up for this alert because I, I promise you it will save your life. We had two tornadoes this past year, uh, one in Satellite Beach, one down south uh, in the, in the Miko area. I talked to countless folks whose phone went off right before the tornado went through their neighborhood and they were able to come inside, they were able to get into an interior room that small act likely saved them from injury. I talked to several folks who were outside, who came inside, and then lost their carport that they were just standing in. So it is critical that everybody's able to receive alerts. You may get it already on a weather app. That's great. Just double check to make sure it's turned on. Again, we highly encourage you to go to our website, which is again, www.embrevard.com. Click the alert sign up, fill it out. It'll take you less than five minutes and you'll be able to put yourself and your family in a position to receive life-saving alerts. And secondly, so that's the first is be able to get those alerts. 
Second thing is know what to do, right? This is Florida. Folks may have moved from here, from the Midwest or else. They say, well, where do I go? I don't have a basement. You don't need a basement. Uh, you just want to find your strongest interior room, your room that has the least amount of windows. Maybe it's a hallway. Maybe it's a bathroom. You know, doesn't mean you're not going to get any damage. But what we really want you to do is once you know where that interior room is, whatever your strongest room is, have something to protect your head. One of the things that research has, has taught us is that most, if not all, fatalities related to tornadoes are because of head trauma and being able to simply guard your head, protect your neck, make sure everything is okay, uh, makes a tremendous difference in the outcome of that life safety event. So pillows, bike helmets, towels, blankets, anything you can stick over your head to make sure that you are safe. And you want to do the same for your family. So if you've got kids, right, just like you would in an airplane, right? Oxygen mask comes down. You want to put your, your head protection on first and then do the same for your children, right? So you get to that, you get the alert, you get to your strongest room, you protect your head, we get through whatever comes out and we begin recovery on the other side. That is what we're, that's what we're trying to get everybody to do. That's where we want to get everyone to. You know, we talked a lot about building a culture of preparedness in this county. This is one of those steps. So for tornadoes, right, we know what to do. We get the warning, we put our plan into action, we protect our head, we see what happens. Real. Tornadoes aren't like hurricanes, right? Sometimes we can see hurricanes one, two, three, four, sometimes even a week in advance, right? But the fact is tornadoes often have very little lead time. Yes, we can tell you that the environment is favorable for tornadoes, but tornadoes are hyper-local events. They come down to whether or not they're gonna impact your street or not. But they come and go move through your community extremely fast and and sometimes extremely violently. So having a plan in place is critical. And part of that severe weather plan, uh, awareness plan that we want to reiterate is having multiple ways to receive warnings. So whether that is through Alert Brevard, your favorite weather app, or NOAA Weather Radio, or wireless emergency alerts, which we touched on, it doesn't matter how you get the warnings, make sure you have a backup plan in place. Yeah, and I know in, in one, thing, one thing you touched on is an important distinction for folks is so we may have uh, a day where we know we might sort of have conditions broadly that are right for a tornado, right? So you guys might issue a tornado watch. Yeah. Um, what we want folks to key in is on the tornado warning. Absolutely. And sometimes those things can be confusing, like watch warning, what does it mean? Like best way, I know how to describe it, I'm, I'm a Florida boy, I'm a Brevard boy, I like my key lime pie. Uh, so watch is basically, I'm going to make some pie, I've got all the ingredients in front of me, at some time there will likely be pie, maybe not for me, but there's ingredients in front of me, right? So that's the watch. The warning is, pie's done, I'm ready to have it, it's in front of me. Absolutely. We want people to be able to respond, when it's pie time, they're going, okay, I've got my warning, I'm going to my strongest place, I'm protecting my head, I'm getting through to the other side, because you're going to have... Maybe 15 minutes or less to do all that all the time. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. So you've got to be able to do it quickly. So watch is letting you know, hey, conditions are favorable. Warning means tornado on the ground near you. Yeah. Our goal, of course, is to have anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes of lead time. But sometimes, quick. You, especially during the summer months when these tornadoes are short-lived and rapid, you might only get one, two, maybe three minutes. But sometimes that's all you need to ultimately get into the safest place yeah. in your home, right? Now, I know we're going to take some questions, and I want to do that. Um, but what I, what, before we do that is, I want to answer one of the ones we get all the time, which is, why don't we have tornado sirens in Brevard County and really in the state of Florida? And, I mean, I'm gonna let, I'll let you talk to it as well, but a couple of things to remember is, one, tornado sirens are really good if you're outdoors. If you're indoors, they're hard to hear. Uh, and depending on how your home is constructed, you know, a lot of us have either those thicker windows for hurricanes or maybe, we, so they, it make, it's harder for that sound to get in, right? And two, just like we touched on, we've advanced our warning system so That's far a good point. that we don't need that kind of thing, right? You may have a siren that covers, you know, four blocks or half a mile or a mile, whereas your cell phone is likely near you at all times certainly something you're going to be able to hear in your house. So tornado sirens are great 25 years ago. <laughs> Today, we have the ability to alert you in your pocket, 
next to your bed, on your nightstand, and that's really what we want people to do. I mean, we'll all let you talk about it as well. That's true. The fact is, tornado sirens were designed for those folks who were outside, which of course is an important component to, you know, the warning paradigm, right? But the fact is, we want to be able to reach everyone, and that includes people inside, and so they just don't work, especially in a state where the population is just sprawled out across such like, Do you know the number of tornado sirens that we would have to have in our community to be effective? It, it, would, it would not yeah. be cost-effective. Yeah, so I mean, like, so we did some research one time, just looking into it, and it's literally, it, it's you have to have at, at a minimum one tornado siren for every square mile. So we're seventy-two miles long, twenty-two miles wide. Someone at home can do that math, but I can tell you that's a lot of sirens, Thanks. and it, the the cost benefit on that is definitely there. Again, when we have the technology to alert your pocket sure. that hey, you need to be doing something because there's a threat out there that may impact you. I know that may feel a little counterintuitive to folks, but again, it's just part of technology continuing to move us forward and continue to help us be safer. It goes back to the idea of having multiple ways to receive warnings being so critical, of which alert brevard, wireless emergency alerts, no weather radio, television, and radio are all part of that equation. So, so uh, I've got Rachel and like we're, she's saying no, we're good on questions. Good Everything's on questions. going well. I see we've been talking with you guys for 26 minutes, so I think... Uh, that's a lot of us talking. That's a lot of us talking. <laughs> uh, well then, um, we'll do one last call for questions. Uh, folks, give them a second, see if anyone has anything they want to ask us. Should I have my disaster kit in my safe space? So that's a great question. It's a, should I have my disaster kit in my safe space? I would say yes. Uh, at least accessible. Now the difference between hurricanes and tornadoes where the disaster kit pays a little bit of a longer role for hurricanes is uh, the impact can be pretty quick. So should you be unfortunate enough to be struck by a tornado that does some damage, having your disaster supply kit near you is um, helpful. And obviously as you begin your recovery, it's gonna be very helpful in expediting that. But because we're talking about such a short time between warning and possible impacts, we, we mostly just want you focused on getting to that safe space and again, having something to protect your head. If it works for you at your house to keep your disaster supply kit in that area, all the better. Any other questions we're getting? I think we should do this again in advance of hurricane season though, John, what do you think? Maybe we can talk again with folks in May? I'm all for it. All right. Appreciate it. So I think what we'll do, and I'll let you close this out, is remind folks, location-based alerts are critical. Maybe you're someone who receives our text messages when we talk about rockets, when we talk about uh, activating for things like hurricanes or prescribed burns. All of that's great, but that's not going to tell you if a tornado is coming to your house or it's in your area. It is paramount that you are signing up, you're getting that. Maybe, again, maybe it is already through your wireless emergency alert. Maybe it's through your favorite weather app. Uh, maybe you've got the weather radio in there and that works. Like all of that is great, but you've got to have it tied to your location, where you are. And then once you know how to do that, you get to your safe space, you protect your head, we come out the other side. It's so important to be prepared, regardless of what Mother Nature is going to throw at you, 365 days out of the year. But this year, it takes a little bit special meaning, right? During a strong El Nino winter, statistically speaking, we are more likely to see severe weather in our community. And so the fact is we want folks to be prepared for that potential, for that strong to violent tornado to potentially impact us. Of course, we don't want that to happen, right? But Mother Nature is going to dictate that. So having a preparedness plan in place, particularly as it relates to tornadoes, is crucial as we move into the next couple of months, which again, statistically speaking, is the peak of our severe weather season. So hopefully with this information in mind, you and your family can stay safe. And John, I appreciate you coming out to the weather office and uh, participating in today's live. Thanks for having us. We love your expertise. And we are so lucky and provided to have National Weather Service Melbourne uh, right here with us, always providing us that kind of support. And being, Thanks, John. not just the support, being part of our community, understanding all the different things that make Brevard such a unique and special place to live. So we'll thank you. Uh, Rachel and Logan, who helped put this together, they're behind the scenes. Thank you guys for everything today, and thank you all for joining. Uh, we will do this again in, in the future. Have a great day, Brevard. Thanks all.